Hello everyone, thank you for coming to Docker Multi Arch for all the things. Uh, we have presenting today Phil Sess, who is a solution, or senior technical staff, sorry, for IBM Cloud, uh, and tweets as SSP. And Michael Fries, who is a product manager at Docker, and tweets also at Friesen. Thank, thanks, Ben. Uh, welcome to this session. Um, let's get the right computer. Um, yeah, so what Phil and I will be talking about today is, is Multiarch. And um, Multiarch is the term that we use for the fact that um, we've been spending the past couple of years uh, porting Docker to a bunch of different uh, CPU architectures and, and operating systems. Um, so Do Docker now works on x86, 64, which was where I started, on ARM, uh, IBM C, um, PowerPC, uh, and Windows, and Linux, and a bunch of other places. Um, and that comes with a bunch of benefits. Obviously, you get the same Docker experience uh, no matter your infrastructure, uh, but it also comes with some challenges that we'll go into more detail um, about today, uh, including um, how to build and maintain container images that, that work on, on, on all these different systems, and um, also details on how you do kind of multi-arc orchestration. So if you have heterogeneous clusters that have both mainframes and uh, kind of generic um, Intel boxes in them. H how do you manage uh, scheduling across a swarm of, of those kind of systems? Um, so just, just to give you an idea of, um, of what it means for Docker to, to, to run a bunch of different places, we're actually going to start out with a, with a really quick demo. Um, so I have um, three, uh, three shells here. Let's see if I can get on the Windows box, yeah. Um, so, um, th this is a this is a cluster that we're gonna we're gonna do some more demos on this uh, cluster later. But right now, I just have a, like a shell on on each of the systems, and Docker is installed on all of them. So you can see on this one, it's running on uh, Linux um, and then x86 64, so a generic uh, generic kind of Linux box. Um, on this one. I'm also on Linux, but I'm on an uh, IBM C mainframe. So the CPU, CPU architecture moniker for IBM C is uh, System 390. And on this final one, um, I'm on Windows. So you can see it's actually a PowerShell prompt. Um, and uh, Docker is reporting that this is running a um, um, that this is running on Windows uh, on, on x86 hardware. Um, so that's great. Docker's running all these places, um, but what, what, what does that mean for the for the user experience? So as we were uh, porting Docker, um, one of the things that we really wanted to preserve from from the original Docker experience on Linux um, x86 was that kind of magical thing where you just pull a Docker image, um, and you get. Like you don't have to worry about installation or setup or, or configuration or misconfiguration. Um, you, you pull a piece of software and it's bundled up in a container and it just magically runs uh, I immediately. Um, so that's what I'll show. Um, basically doing Docker run, Golang. So this uh, uh, tells Docker, hey, go fetch the Golang image uh, and run it. And the command I want to run is go version. So this is just asking go to report uh, the version. Um, so um, I just ran the Golang image on Linux um, x86. Um, and I can do the same thing here. Go version. And I have another Go, uh, I have another go, go image, uh, but this time um, it's also on Linux, but Go is actually compiled uh, natively for, for S390. And it's finally on Windows. Um, version. Um, so Docker is running um, um, a, Go, a Golang image on Windows. There's natively compiled uh, Go executables, uh, exes, um, and Go is reporting that it's running on, on AMD64. And so, so the, the beauty of this is that um, on this, these wildly different operating systems, wildly different hardware, mainframes, um, x86 boxes, you get the same Docker experience. Tap the same command, and it, it all just works magically, the same way it did originally when um, when Docker just supported Linux and, and x86. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, this this came about um, as we've been porting Docker to uh, to different architectures. So that's um, 
that's a screen grab of Solomon um, demoing uh, Docker way back in 2013 at uh, PyCon. Um, then through 2013 and 14, uh, people started porting um, uh, Docker to, to ARM, and also people at IBM started uh, the porting work to IBM C and, uh, and PowerPC. Um, then in 2014, uh, Docker also um, uh, built a partnership with Microsoft. Um, so Microsoft and Docker together started porting um, different bits and pieces of Docker to Windows. Um, so this is a tweet um, from Microsoft that they got the CLI compiling and working on, on Windows. And that continued. A um, bunch of interest in, in the Pi and kind of Raspberry Pi community. Um, so we got that working in 2015. Um, and 2016 was when we GA'd um, support for Docker on, on Windows systems, so Windows Server 2016 and Windows 10, so that stuff that I worked on at, um, at Docker. So I spent a bunch of time on this. Um, and then finally this year, we also announced a GA of uh, Docker on IBM C uh, mainframes and on, on PowerPC servers. Um, so the, the, the idea with MultiArc is that Docker, Docker is running on, on all these different systems. A core, core tenet of Docker is that it should be the same experience, it should be seamless and easy. Um, so um, we want to build into Docker um, primitives and, and adapt protocols so, so that we can make that work um, across, uh, across different types of systems. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about um, what it takes to build uh, Docker images and container images that, that are multi-arc aware and that work on, on different types of systems. Um, so an important thing to remember here is that um, containers, containers are unlike virtual machines. Um, so with virtual machines, you, kinda, you, virtualize, you virtualize the hardware, um, which gives you a lot, a lot, of, a lot of freedom to, to do crazy stuff like run uh, Windows apps uh, on top of a Linux host and vice versa. You can even, uh, if you're using virtual machines, you can even emulate different hardware. So for example, with, uh, with QEMU, you can run, say, ARM, ARM, um, ARM uh, binaries um, with, um, by, by virtualizing the uh, ARM hardware on an x86 box, for example. Um, contain containers are a little bit different. Um, with containers, if you have a bunch of containers running on the same host, they actually share, share the operating system kernel, uh, both with other stuff running on that host and, and between all the containers running on that host. Um, so you, you have a little bit, bit less uh, flexibility and you're kind of stuck with, with uh, host CPU and, and kernel that Docker, that Docker is running on. Um, and what that kind of tra translates into is um, that um, to, run, or, or, or to, to run a piece of software on x86 Linux, for example, you have to build and compile a um, Docker image for x86 Linux, and vice versa for, for, for Windows. So that's what the um, bottom, bottom right um, diagram is showing. Um, so you have a Linux Nginx image. Um, that'll pull and run correctly on an x86 uh, Linux box with Docker installed. If you have Microsoft IIS, for example, that's a, a Windows-only app, that, that will pull and run correctly on Docker running on a Windows system, but you can't, you can't really uh, mix and match those. Um, yep, so the takeaway there is that you're gonna need to build uh, image variants for, for each of the operating systems and, and CPU architectures that, that you wanna um, support, and, and we built uh, support for that into the protocols and, and systems that Docker has, so, so Phil will go into detail about that. All right. Thank you, Michael. Did anyone notice anything? <laughs> we kind of dressed alike. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, as Michael said, um, you know, obviously porting the Docker engine to, to various uh, platforms and architectures was a huge step forward uh, to kind of give everyone that same possible experience. Um, but as he just said, uh, then your next um, issue is, okay, I want that same Docker run image name experience across these platforms. And obviously as we get further into this talk and look at a, a cluster, uh, that becomes very interesting to have a service that, that spans multiple architectures or operating systems. 
So the solution uh, to this was the creation of a image type in the Docker image spec called a manifest list. And so this is the way that, that we effectively support the concept of having per, plat per platform images under the single name or reference in the registry. So you can kind of see some history about that. Uh, a lot of that work ended up being finalized uh, last January. So there's a, a new media type that the Docker registry understands uh, called this manifest list. And effectively, this, uh, this looks like a set of pointers, uh, effectively, a, a platform segregated uh, set of references. So I build image A on uh, Intel x86. I build uh, maybe the same Docker file. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the complexities there uh, on S390X or on Power. And now the manifest list gives me a way to assemble those under a single name in the registry so that we get that Docker run experience that Michael showed you. Uh, this is the output of a, um, a simple query tool uh, that I put together. So if we look at the Golang image, uh, this was actually run before the Windows um, entry was added to it. So in Docker Hub today, uh, it actually has the Windows entry, but you can see uh, all the ARM platforms, even 386 um, and Power and, and S390X. So manifest lists uh, were kind of that bridge to, to bring in the other piece. So now you have the Docker engine. Now you also have image support uh, to be able to have the same experience across platforms. Um, I won't go through this in great detail. Um, Steve-O here put this uh, image together a while back and we've been using it in various talks about Containerd and the engine. Uh, but effectively, this gives you a visual representation of what I just talked about, that a, a manifest list is a set of references that are segregated by platform. Uh, once I find out, you know, I'm a Docker engine, I say, oh, I'm running on S390X, I need to look up uh, the manifest config and layers for that platform, and now the Docker engine acts as it would with a single architecture manifest, it pulls out the config into a runtime spec. It builds your root file system out of the layers. And so you get that seamless experience and the engine has done all the hard work of resolving which set of layers to pull. So where are we today? So as I said, the, the manifest list concept uh, was finalized. Docker 1.10 was the first release that uh, had both the registry and the engine capability to understand this manifest list concept. And since then, a lot of uh, people have been working pretty hard to, to put together images um, that use this capability. And so, uh, I don't know if anyone saw the blog post or the tweets, uh, but the official Docker Hub images, so it's roughly 130 odd images. Uh, for example, Docker pull or Docker run Ubuntu, Docker run Mongo, all these basic official Docker images are now manifest lists. Being a manifest list doesn't mean it supports every possible architecture because obviously that takes work behind the scenes and we'll talk a little bit about building images for architectures, but many of them um, support quite a few architectures. Many of them support five, six, seven architectures. Uh, the .NET Core images are also multi-arc. Uh, Linux Kit, which if you're in here, you're missing a great talk on Linux Kit. If you get bored here, maybe you can run over there. Uh, they have been using uh, multi-arc images for um, a few months as well in their repository, which again, gives them this nice ability to use the same YAML to build Linux Kit against different architectures. And, and uh, obviously there's a lot of... Uh, ARM community projects around the, the Pi, ARM64, that again can take advantage of the multi-arc capability and are doing that today. So let's do a quick demo. Um, so uh, right before I, I you know, show that, uh, Manifest Tool is something I put together that interacts with a registry with this new object type, the Manifest List. Um, this is, in a sense, somewhat temporary because work is happening in the Docker client to add a Docker manifest subcommand, which will uh, do much of the work that manifest tool does today. But while that PR is being reviewed and finalized, manifest tool is being used in the official image repo to assemble the images with Linux kit. 
And so for now, uh, it's one of the easiest ways to assemble a set of images into a manifest list. So what I have, um, that font seemed pretty good for folks read readable. Um, so what I have here, um, I have a, f a few different uh, manifest tool uh, YAML files that uh, basically create, let me show you this, this very simple uh, Go program that basically listens on a port and responds with hello from host, I'm a node running architecture, uh, whatever my architecture is and an operating system. Go programs are very easy to cross compile, so I have a Docker file that I can easily build out for many architectures. Um, so in my uh, YAML, which I can input to, to the manifest tool, um, I can build you know, various assemblies of images. Here I'm, I'm gonna call one partial because I don't have all the architectures I care about in here. I have mostly Linux across four different uh, architectures. Um, but when I take this partial uh, YAML file, manifest, and again, I've already built, uh, let me bring that up again just to make that clear. I've already built the files that you see under image for each platform. So the Who Am I, AMD64, S390X. So I already built those. You could build, we're gonna talk a little bit about a CI model for building this. And, and you can actually even look at the official image repos. All the tools they use are open source. You can see how people are assembling these today. Um, so I've already got these, these uh, images. I wanna assemble it under the name Who Am I with the tag partial. So I'm gonna run manifest tool, push from spec and use this partial YAML. And that will uh, talk to Docker Hub. I'm, I'm writing this to uh, my SSP uh, repo. So that created who am I partial. And at this point, I can actually use this, uh, this nice tool uh, in platform and query. Who am I? Sorry, that's under my repo. Who am I? Partial. And that's going to query, uh, again, talk to, to uh, Docker Hub and query the manifest list. And I'm sorry, that's a little low on the screen. Let me get that higher. So again, this is, this is the, the YAML I input. I said these are the platforms and it uh, pointed to those images. Uh, if I, I'm actually gonna start this as a service because one of the easiest ways uh, to show this is to deploy it and then um, I have a compose file here. And that's gonna deploy it on my cluster. And it's probably interesting at this point to show you that uh, the who am I, um, yeah, I'm, I should have edited that first. So let's actually docker stack rm, who am I? Because my docker compose file, I, I used the, um, the one pointing at the image I've already pushed with all the architectures. So obviously that didn't, that didn't uh, do what I'd hope because you actually saw it on every node, which means that included the Windows node. So now, if we look at the visualizer, you can see that it placed it on the two x86-64 nodes. You can see it running on the S390X node, but you don't see it running on this Windows worker. Uh, obviously, there are some other things running because I've got UCP and the voting uh, app already deployed here. Uh, but obviously, uh, you can tell that um, that I used the image that I created that was partially supported. Um, uh, Swarm noticed that it wasn't available for Windows, and so the placement engine realized it couldn't put a Who Am I uh, service task on the Windows node. And so now, uh, just to save a little time, uh, I'm, I've already pushed the full image, and so now if I Docker stack deploy, 
uh, without the partial, um, we should see it also deployed onto the Windows node. So again, uh, Swarm is recognizing the manifest list, uh, seeing that the list of architectures includes Windows, and is able to place that uh, across all the nodes. Um, so in the interest of, of time, we're gonna look at um, a little more complicated uh, application in a few minutes, but I think at this point, uh, we'll go on and Michael will talk about Docker file maintenance. Yep. <clears throat> so the who am I example that, that Phil had was uh, uh, super simple. Uh, he didn't show the Docker file, but uh, small pro uh, Go programs are very easy to cross compile. Um, so it's, it's not too difficult to, to cross compile and build that for, for multiple operating systems or, or Docker files. But what, what typically ends up happening is so if you're familiar with what goes in a Docker file, it's basically a series, series of steps that go into uh, building or, or like gra grabbing the dependencies for, for an app and, and, and building it and, and packaging it up. Um, and what you'll generally, generally see is that you can probably share the same Docker file or, or, maybe, um, or very similar Docker files uh, as long as you stay on Linux, for example. Um, the same Docker file will work to compile uh, on different hardware, ARM x86, um, S390. Um, there are maybe some variations uh, here and there. For example, for S390, you might pull in um, some extra packages to take advantage of, of uh, specific hardware. Uh, uh, for different operating systems, uh, for example, for, for Linux uh, or Windows, um, you can write very simple Docker files that, that actually work on both um, uh, uh, Windows and Linux, but typically because, like, literally the shell on Windows is PowerShell or cmd.exe, and the shell on, on um, Linux is, is SH, uh, the commands are just going to be different. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually an example I pulled from the uh, .NET Core uh, Docker repo. Uh, so on the, left, uh, on the left, you can see uh, the Windows Docker file. And on the right, there's a Linux Docker file. You can see on the left, there's like PowerShell commands. Invoke web request is the Windows way to do curl. Um, and ZX uh, setting the, the path and, and stuff like that. Uh, on the right is the Linux Docker file so that they derive from a kind of intermediary image, but you can see they run app get update, app get install, and then they curl to, to get a hold of the um, uh, of uh, .NET Core and uh, to install it. So different operating systems, you're probably going to end up having having different um, Docker files. So how does how does uh, multi arc images get built? Um, uh, that that can be a little bit challenging because remember. Um, to, to run a container for a particular operating system or CPU architecture, you, you, you have to have a host that has that operating system and that, and that CPU architecture. So for example, in, in, in this case, uh, building for both Linux and Windows, you're going to need both a Windows host at the bottom and, and a Linux host uh, up top. But the way you can construct it is um, you have a Git, uh, some sort of Git system, GitHub, um, whatever you like. You, you push code there. Um, there's a hook that triggers Docker builds on, um, on, on Windows uh, and, and Linux. And then as each of those builds complete, they push that kind of component OS-specific uh, image. So the Windows daemon will push uh, the Windows image. The Linux daemon pushes the Linux image. And then um, you can have a separate step that will invoke the um, fills manifest tool to, to create the manifest list that has the two entries for, for Windows and Linux, and then it can push the, the, the manifest list. And, and then you have your, your kind of multi arg image. You can also build or string this together from um, C, uh, kind of free open, uh, open CI systems like, uh, like Travis or Abvia. Um, all right, so that covered kind of building and, um, and maintaining uh, multi arg uh, container images. Um, so, Imagine you now have, uh, like Phil had with his uh, Who Am I Im image, a, a kind of multi arc image. What, what do you do about um, uh, deploying that on a heterogeneous uh, swarm um, that is maybe running both uh, Windows and Linux machines or x86 and mainframes in, in the same swarm? Um, so if, if you just have a kind of a, a, um, 
a, a DOM orchestrator that it would it might try if it w wasn't aware of of architecture constraints, then it might just try scheduling images that in fact only work for Windows or Linux on on um, hosts that don't support it. So for Swarm, um, we spent a bunch of time actually making Swarm um, um, architecture and operating system aware. Um, and the way that works is that whenever you do Docker service create uh, or similar, um, uh, Docker and Swarm actually figures out this this image, what what uh, what uh, CPU architectures and, and operating systems uh, will it run on, and then it uses that as it schedules tasks for that service to so that um, tasks tasks are only scheduled um, where, where they're going to run reliably. Um, so. That covers kind of the, the automatic uh, scheduling, and, and Phil's going to demo it in a bit. Um, sometimes you're also going to want, uh, even though you have a heterogeneous swarm, uh, you might have multi arc images, but you actually want to constrain a particular image to a, um, um, to, to a particular set of hosts. Like maybe you run or run something super security critical on your mainframe systems. Um, and for that, uh, we also support uh, what's called scheduling constraints, and F Phil's going to demo that also. Uh, but it's basically a way to say, uh, for this service, please only run it on Windows, or please only run it on Linux, or, or maybe run it on, on this type of hardware or this other type of hardware. Um, yeah, this uh, just shows um, some of the technical details about that work, how, how that works. Um, so when you do Docker service create, um, Docker figures out what what's the supported set of uh, architectures uh, f for, for the image that you're about to deploy. And then it actually, you can see the um, um, output of Docker service inspect over, the, over on the right. It actually makes a note in the service definition of the, the platforms that are going to be supported by this image. And then it uses that as it does scheduling. Um, and then we, in Docker Compose, we have um, support for specifying the, the manual constraints in the Compose YAML file. Um, so Phil's going to uh, demo this stuff now. He's going to demo on the, on the same swarm that I showed uh, three shells on at the beginning of the talk. Um, so we have both Windows, Linux, and, and uh, IBM C uh, mainframe. All right. So yeah, let's um, maybe take a quick look at that cluster instead of um, the uh, visualizer. We can actually look at it in the uh, in universal control plane. So. Again, the dashboard here um, showing um, that I have four nodes in my cluster. You can see the list here. So we have um, IBM Infrastructure Cloud uh, Manager. We've got an EC2 uh, Windows instance, uh, the Z uh, Linux One node, uh, and then a DigitalOcean, also another x86. And so these are joined. Um, as you can see, they're definitely not in the same data center. So we, in essence, have this hybrid cloud uh, across multiple data centers. Um, three of them are workers. Uh, only the one is a manager. Um, and so uh, how many people have seen the, uh, the voting app over the years used at DockerCon? Come on, you've, you've seen the cats versus dogs. Um, so yeah, so we've had some serious concerns about voter fraud uh, with the voting app. And uh, so... We have it deployed here. Um, we have a few different different choices than usual. Uh, mainframes versus boring x86 VMs. Um, so anyway, we, th we thought, well, what if we, uh, and actually before I even get there, one of the cool things is that, um, you know, without changing the Docker Compose file that's already out there on GitHub that's been used at various Docker cons, uh, without having to change um, anything, in that compose file, uh, the voting, you know, result, the vote, the database, the worker, the Redis node, um, all were deployed across various uh, nodes on our cluster because the Docker official images are now multi-arc. We didn't have to do anything to get a fairly uh, broad deployment across our nodes. You can see pieces of it uh, on, on various nodes. Um, so that's, that's good news. Um, so again, what we thought we would do is, you know, how about we constrain that Postgres database node to S390X, to the Z uh, mainframe, because um, 
If you're not aware, we've got the secure system containers. No one's going to get access to that. The memory's encrypted. The network's encrypted. And if you want to buy that, we have Mo on the front row, who's probably ready to sell that today if you, if you need those capabilities. Um, but no, seriously, these are uh, you know, potentially real situations where you want a workload on a very specific uh, node in your cluster. So here I have the YAML. Again, this is straight from the uh, DockerCon uh, demos of old. Uh, I haven't, the only thing I've changed is that now my database um, constraint, so you see my placement constraint there near the top of the screen. I've said actually I want the, um, the node.platform.architecture to equal S390X. And so uh, you can constrain by OS, you can constrain by architecture. And so as, um, as Michael was just showing you, let's see if I have the Docker service inspect. Um, let's look at the uh, voting app DB. And it went a little bit off the screen, but here, so again, those are all the architectures that the Postgres image that is used in our compose file supports. So it could have been placed on any node that met that criteria, but at the bottom here, we actually added this constraint that the uh, node platform architecture equals S390X. And so uh, again, um, I just realized from my demo, I've already deployed it <laughs> like this. We could remove the constraint and see if it gets placed elsewhere. We have three minutes, 36 seconds. Who wants to? Sure. All Go right, <laughs> let's have fun and see if we break something. Um, Phil, I, I specifically asked you whether you had reset the I know, <laughs> I know you did. So Docker server, let's see if I can get this right. Cons uh, no. Um, constraint RM. Oh, that's gutsy. Node uh, platform arc equals S390X. Voting. Do I, do I need something around that? No, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. Uh, oh, man. You did it. No, no. it didn't do it. Oh. You can also just blow it away. I What'd you say? This is live demo at its best. Yeah, our constraint's gone. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> and it was actually moved. No, it wasn't. Or did it? It's back. <laughs> I guess the database really knows it's supposed to be on S390X. Um, it's fine. Yeah. So, you know, but the, the, the app works. We can change our vote. We can see them change. Um, and again, I think the beauty of this is that we didn't have to change anything about the compose file. Uh, we can simply add and remove constraints if we want workloads on a certain node. But using manifest lists and multi-architecture support, we kind of have this single pane of glass support of a hybrid, hybrid swarm uh, across a set of nodes. So I'm going to leave it to um, Michael to finish up. Actually, one thing I wanted to know, if you want to take a look at an example CI, so that Who Am I service uh, we demoed, um, SSP slash DockerCon, my GitHub repo, has a Travis YAML file and an AppVayer file, and that's actually how I was building and deploying it. Uh, Stefan Scherer, another Docker captain, has done a lot of that work. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things there, but I'll let uh, Michael finish this out. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, and definitely also check out uh, Phil's uh, manifest tool um, for, for doing all this work and this uh, resources uh, in that repo also. Um, yeah, so just to, to kind of recap, um, the, the thing to take away, I think, is that um, container images, because of the, the way that containers work, like they're tied to the operating system and, and CPU that, that you build them on, you, you have to worry about if, if you want uh, containers to run on multiple different operating systems and um, CPU architectures, you're going to have to worry about uh, 
compiling and building them for, for each of those systems. Um, but um, people like us at Docker and uh, Phil at IBM and also at Microsoft and other places are spending a bunch of time uh, building tools and protocol support to make this seamless and easy, uh, including Manifest tool, and by uh, making the uh, Docker official images, .NET Core, uh, Linux Kit, etc., uh, multi arc So, so mostly, um, if you're just a Docker end user, you don't have to worry about it too much. And, and you, you can build apps that are going to run on both ARM, x86, uh, Windows, Linux, etc., and IBM C. Um, and finally, as, as Phil showed you, um, Docker Enterprise Edition with Universal Control Plane supports heterogeneous clusters, and you can you can get a single pane of glass, uh, glass that shows you stuff running. Um, uh, and where you can manage uh, apps running across all of those uh, different systems. Um, yeah, I think we'll, with that we'll take questions. Uh, these are details. You also feel free to tweet at us uh, if you have questions or, or feedback. Um, yeah, take thanks. It. We have four minutes officially if there are any burning questions in the audience. Uh oh, we answered all the questions. Here That's we good. go. Uh, how constrained are you being by the um, multi arc capabilities of the things you're trying to containerize? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I'll, I'll speak from an IBM perspective. So we've had a long history of involvement in open source. So we have teams in our systems group who've been making sure that all the classic open source. Uh, projects that people like to use, whether it's you know Apache, Nginx, Mongo, Postgres, MySQL. You know these have been building on our platforms for years. Um, so that's sort of an easy answer about open source. Obviously, if you have custom applications, uh, Michael showed some of the complexities of obviously Windows and Linux. Um, um, you know, it, it really depends on the, on what you're trying to containerize. Uh, assembler yeah. code for x86, okay, you're probably stuck. Uh, but th things that can cross-compile, things that have support generally for multiple architectures, that's obviously the easier end of the spectrum. I mean, we, like, so one of the things we also spend a bunch of time on is, um, um, so a lot of our apps, like Universal Control Plane and Docker Trusted Registry are actually based on Alpine images, mm -hmm. so, uh, which is this kind of minimal Linux distro that we help maintain. Uh, so we had to spend some amount of time getting that to compile correctly and, and have all the utils uh, yep. for, for IBM C and Power, for example. Yep. Yep. This question? Adrian? So how common are well, it's loud. Um, so how common are multi-architecture clusters, and uh, do you see them becoming more common? So I mean, we we have a bunch of um, we have a bunch of customers, uh, which is why this partnership with IBM is is really great for Docker. That that actually genuinely run big mainframes, big uh, mainframe deployments, and. Uh, they like them, and they want Docker to run there so that they can get all the benefits of containerization and, and kind of improved agility uh, while still running stuff on, on mainframes. So we, we, basically, uh, we, we definitely have a, a bunch of customers that are, that are doing that. And then we're also spending uh, a bunch of time with, with Microsoft with our partnership for, for Windows and uh, kind of bringing together, I think, um, uh, Linux and Windows operators uh, in, in one swarm where you can manage um, apps that run on both Linux and Windows side by side. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, we, I mean, at IBM we definitely have customers. You know, a lot of that, obviously that's not public cloud, that's mostly on-premises data centers where they've, they've had a traditional workload on mainframe, you know, coexisting that with, with Z Linux, and then they also have, you know, standard x86. So yeah, we've definitely seen that with our customer set. Other questions? All right. All right. Thanks, Thank for, you. thanks for stopping by.